The goal of attempting to work in a very diverse way was a notion that I had that the genre could accommodate more than just dancing. I was really convinced around uh, the mid-90s, uh, around 1995, 96, that I had seen the genre expand a little bit too quickly, meaning that, you know, overnight, people were understanding basically what we were trying to say in Detroit and what was happening in, you know, in, in different parts, P people were really un understanding very quickly. And, um, and I had become convinced that, um, um, that there could be much more territory to cover in terms of using uh, music to bring certain things to certain people, uh, cer certain subjects, certain ideas, certain visions. Um, and that if we got better at this um, way of communicating 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, it could manifest itself into something uh, incredible, something that no other genre could, could uh, c come close to actually uh, doing. So, so I, I started around that time to, to really begin to think very seriously about considering music in other ways. Uh, Take, taking this music and attaching it to other things. And it wasn't really until around the year 1999, 2000, that I really uh, was convinced that uh, maybe uh, to start with film and, and moving images might, might be the best way to, to introduce this idea of considering this music outside the dance floor. The way that I approach making these cinemixes is something that I, has developed over time. I've been creating them for about a decade now, and um, have done, I don't know, maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 rescores of films. But these period type of films are very, very interesting, very, very unique, because you know, the way that I do it, I, I memorize the film and then turn to composing the music for it. So I'm not watching the film and writing for, the, for each segment, but I memorize every part of the film, every movement, every scene, um, and then do a calculation as to how, what are things happening and th that determines the tempo. If it's a very clustered scene with many things happening, then I know I, have, I can use more sounds. If it's a very minimal scene, then I can you know, just uh, create it in a very simple way. But when I memorize the film, it becomes ingrained in my memory. In the case of Berlin Symphony of a Great City, I, I lived here for, um, almost like 15 years. So most of my memory of Europe is actually here in Berlin. So working on this film uh, was very strange. I myself, you know, walked down a lot of these streets, have seen these buildings, have seen these apartments, seen the same window, the same facade, the same fire hydrant. Um, it was really strange for me to work on it. Um, and Knowing the context, this was 1929, just before things were really changing uh, politically. Um, looking at the film, looking at the people, wondering if they were sensing what was coming. Um, looking at young children, uh, looking at you know younger people, realizing that in a few years their life was literally about to be turned upside down. Looking for signs. Even now, when I look at the film, you have some type of sympathy for what was coming, you know, and how vibrant the city was. Um, I think um, for a lot of Americans, when you, you think of Germany of that era, you think of war, you know, but this was before when, um, you know, the city was very lively and uh, people were more carefree and, you know, was enjoying the industrial age and enjoying, you know, the fruits of life and, and things like that. And so, um, and so the film really captures all that. So it's, it's a very interesting film too. Probably one of the most interesting that, that I've, I've worked on. In this film, you see how literally there were two worlds to the city. There was the, the day and then there was also the night. And they were, and they were very different. The night was very, was very wild and very uh, free and very open, very exotic actually. And um, I don't know if it's like that now. 
I think so. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, you know, it's interesting to kind of look to see what, what, what maintained, what stayed, what really makes up a city, what things are necessary. And, and you have to look, if this happened, you know, 70, 80 years from now, then 70, 80 years ahead, these things probably will still be there. And if you look 160 years, yeah, and Berlin is still here, we will probably have these same things. We always feel that we're right on the edge of, of chaos, you know, and we're tuned to always look for signs of it getting worse or worse, and, and what do we do, and how do we prepare ourselves, and, and where's the, where are the problems, who's the problem, you know, and what did this guy say, and what did this woman do, and, and so we kind of tune to always take a measurement of how we are living and how we're spinning and how we're treating each other. So this film, it does that. Um, you know, the director eventually became uh, a member of the Nazi party. You know, how he was shooting, what he was shooting, what was his mindset while he was filming this film, you know, has to also play to, play a role. Um, Perhaps maybe this was one of the last captures of a city before it turned into something else. And the people here tonight that will look at the film will be able to look around them to see how much progress has happened since that point. So what are the things, how has Berlin kind of recovered and returned to itself? And what are the things that lasted throughout all these decades through you know, all, all these wars and all this conflict. And, and what are the things that really make the city of Berlin? Uh, you should be able to see that in the film.